Just a minute. Hey, Kenny. Hmm. You know that you're live? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I walk away for a moment and hmm. there you go. Well, yesterday was National Donut Day. And I still had some remnants I thought I better clean up this morning. So, as you, as you well know, I have a deep affinity for glazed donuts. But uh, maybe, maybe. Well, I'll have to finish that one later, I guess. But it's good. Okay, <laughs> we should get back to where we are. This is this is Cars and Coffee. Welcome. Uh, we got some really cool things for you today. Uh, the uh, we're going to talk about tips and top tips in buying uh, purchasing a trailer uh, for those that really get. Uh, into and, and, and into the, the track day and really start moving up and getting more and more experience. There's a lot of people would prefer to trailer their cars than drive it to the track. So we're going to talk about what kind of what's some tips on trailers. And we have an example of uh, one, of the, one of the trailers we had built for one of our customers because we actually can get custom trailers built for people. Oh, I should say, I'm Kenny Brown. <laughs> this is Cars and Coffee. And uh, uh, just trailers is just one of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, uh, we also have some some questions on the uh, on the strain shocks on SN95 on the IRS cars, and we have some other questions from the Speed Therapy Society people, and uh, so it's going to be a pretty good show today. Uh, if you're on YouTube, I remember Carrie, if you're on YouTube, uh, click the like button, subscribe button, and the bell to get notifications of uh, episodes and Facebook. Please like and share with your buddies. And you can do a share party just by clicking something and, and you go to share. Uh, I guess some other things. I'm wearing my uh, Mustang Challenge uh, race shirt today uh, simply because it, I came in this morning and uh, I still have all my notes on, on the board from Thursday night. This, this week in the uh, Speak Therapy Academy was wheels and tires. And... Last Thursday night was uh, we did uh, talked about tire temperatures and adjusting pressures in the car. <clears throat> and what I did is I actually pulled out some of my uh, sheets from tire temperature sheets from the World Chal and Mustang Challenge in uh, 2010. And we uh, we did uh, we kind of went through and, and and analyzed the tires. We went from a test a testing uh, a test at uh, Putnam. Then we went all the way to the East Coast and to the uh, New Jersey track. We got the temperatures there, and then went, we went all the way back to the West Coast and went to Laguna, it's just simply because Laguna is an opposite track. Most tracks are clockwise, Laguna is anti-clockwise, so that's why I got, that's Laguna up there for the number 44 car at, uh, in the Mustang Challenge in 2010. So uh, with that, I think we've got uh, Jim Donato here this morning, uh, who, who is a super expert in trailer, but he's not only a trailer expert, he's a car guy. I mean, his, his whole family are into cars. Uh, he used to have a, a dealership where they did a lot of foreign cars. It's the exact same types of cars I worked on back in the 70s. MGs, Fiats, uh, Sunbeams, Triumphs, uh, all, those, all those cars. Uh, and he used to work on those. It was kind of cool. But he's, he's actually uh, helping a customer right now. Uh, so he'll be here in just a second. So with that, I think we can move into, I think we're, we're going to jumble around. But we're going to have him next. But we will uh, get get into some questions. Okay, we had here's here's one. This is, this is the 03 Cobra. You know, he's, uh, he's looking to purchase an 03 Cobra, uh, and wants to know about our IR, uh, doing our IRS system in phases due to budget. And I think a lot of people do that. You know, we've got phase one, two, three, and four. And uh, he wanted to know if uh, a couple of questions he had. Can he use the stock arms with the coilovers? Unfortunately, not. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And he had, at what point in the build process does he need coilovers? I'll, I'll get to that. And I'm kind of framing this up. And what's the best time to add the modified carrier? Uh, what he's talking about is that we take the IRS carrier, we whack all the pickup points off, uh, we whack off the back huge, great big uh, mount mounting bracket in the back, and we put a, 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 a regular plate that bolts right to the frame in the back. So the carrier doesn't move. And then we move all the pickup points, completely change the geometry. Uh, and we do quite a load of them. I think we just, we just did uh, five of them right now at the uh, powder coat. 
So that, that's a pretty popular thing, but I'll talk about that in a second. And then uh, can you use aluminum diff bushings with a stock stock uh, brace? So he's talking about the forward torque brace. I'll start from the bottom and work up. He's talking about these are aluminum diff bushings, and they're a pretty unique design. And the reason for that is, first of all, it's solid. I mean, there's a lot of people have urethane replacement bushings, which is pretty much the same. You get urethane top and bottom. Uh, but this actually does a number of different things because we use this washer system, this really cool washer system. It actually, if you think of that, it kind of looks like a heat sink. Okay. And it actually does work like a heat sink because the, then the differential, there's no way to get heat out of the differential. I mean, it's, it's aluminum is locked in rubber. So we came up with this design and because we stack the washers, we can actually put the washers on the bottom. This will be the top. And by putting the washers on the bottom, we put the, the snout of the, uh, of the differential up in the air and it increases the pinion angle. And for the early, early IRS cars that have some vibration, right, uh, drive line vibration, this fixes most of them. So can you use that with, with a stock? Yes, the answer is yes, you can, because it will replace what's on there. However, however, I strongly recommend that you upgrade to our heavy duty, <laughs> backwards, our heavy duty uh, forward torque brace. The factory one is, basically tube is squashed on the ends to bolt in and it's curved and anybody that knows anything about that engineering knows that you know there's no strength in curves strength is in straight lines or triangles so what we did is we put all straight lines super heavy duty I mean, this this won't move at all and that the dick pushings the forward torque brace and then of course the rear steer kit that we have <clears throat> to help reduce roll steer is like phase one of of uh, improving your the irs and you know moving up in his questions uh, as, as far as the carrier, that's stage four. Okay, stage one is the forward torque brace, the aluminum dip bushings, and the rear steer kit. To get to your other question, let's see uh, at what point did you add the coilovers? Coilovers are step two. Uh, step two is we move to a tubular <laughs> control arm. It is, oh, I almost lost my spacer. A tubular control arm that, as you can see, is double triangulated, super strong, uh, a bunch lighter than the factory, and swing this around. And we actually mount the shock here in double shear. Now, as far as these are these are our, our the coilovers, aluminum body, custom built for me by Strange to my specifications. And this is this is one of the double adjustable, but it's, on the bottom we have a like spherical bearing, half inch spherical bearing at the top. We still use the bayonet mount. However, we, we change the lower bushing to uh, Delrin uh, because that's carrying all the load into the chassis uh, and, and any kind of rubber or urethane is going to squash out and, and just, you know, squash out and start getting loose. That's why we use Delrin on the body. Bottom is super, super strong uh, rubber on the top. But on the bottom, this is a, it's a half inch spherical bearing. On the, you know, on, on, the, on the stock uh, the lower control arms. We have a number of people that just want to put the, the coilovers on, and there are some companies that do coilover kits for that. But I'm uh, I'm not a fan, just simply because if, if you think about it, the lower control arm of an IRS car was engineered uh, for just a shock. Uh, the load bearing for the spring is was in the middle of the control arm onto the chassis, and so that I mean the, the control arm first of all was not engineered for. Uh, coil of a package. Secondly, it's in single shear. Uh, single shear is means as if the, the bolt comes out and this slides onto it, so it's only in single shear. Where we, with ours, this is actually mounted in double shear. So you get all the pieces and put this together. I lost it. Oh well. Anyway, this is in double shear which means that the bearing itself is captured on both sides and it is not going to, not going to fall off and break. So that, that's kind of why we, you, you really can't use our coilover package on, uh, on, on a stock control arm. Uh, I don't even know if the bolt size will fit, uh, but, but that's, you know, that's just kind of something that we just, you know, when we do things, we kind of do them right. And then phase two, if, you, if you're upgrading, would obviously be the aluminum upper control arms. 
I mean, not aluminum, the tubular upper control arms, which are half the weight of the factory. And then, of course, the fourth thing is the doing the, the full geometry upgrade, which makes makes the IRS cars just handle like a dream, a total dream. So that's, that's kind of answers your questions. I got all of them packed into one little thing. I think uh, while we're waiting for Jim to come back, I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, let's see. Somebody want to know about uh, marking the race tires, uh, putting a mark where the, where the valve stem is to see if there's any slip under braking or acceleration. Uh, I, I think that that's, it, it, that's a good idea, but I'm going to preface that with you know, my personal feeling is I, I don't like seeing uh, track day cars that aren't fully set up with slicks. Uh, it, it's, it's a mismatch. I mean, the, the, the stickier the tire, the more spring you need, the more spring you need, the more shock you need. Uh, a lot of people, when they, they just they think they're going to be really fast just by throwing a set of slicks on the car, and what happens is the, the, the it's about slip angle. A stock tire has a, a certain amount of slip angle going around the corner, which means it's only going to let you go so fast, which means the car is only going to roll so far. You put a super sticky tire on there, and all of a sudden, the slip angle is like super reduced. The tires grip. The tires will grip, and, and the body will keep rolling and rolling and rolling. And as it does, the uh, front suspension goes uh, positive uh, and camber, and you wear out the tires. Also, they're, you know, they don't, they're not going to give you much warning when they let go. To give you an idea, like a stock, I say a Boss Mustang uh, uh, 2012 has a one, I think 137 pound front spring. Our, our street performance package has, uh, our touring package has 350 in the front, street performance 400. Intermediate track is 500, 550. Advanced track is 650 with good track tires. Now, for slicks in the World Challenge, in my late son Paul's World Challenge car with Pirelli slicks, we were running 850, 950 springs with motorsport shocks. I mean, that's the, to really make this, the tires work. That's the kind of spring rate you need. Because a lot of people will just they'll just look at the tires that wear the outside edge with slicks, and they keep adding more and more camber. They get three three degrees or beyond, and you know Pirelli uh, has a has, you cannot run a Pirelli more than three degrees negative camber. So there's a whole lot of reasons not to use a slick with unless the car is set up unless you got the right springs, the right shock and the right suspension geometry, then you can use slicks. But otherwise, I strongly recommend there's a lot of other good tire choices, track day tire choices, uh, which, uh, which will work every bit as good. And maybe even better in some cases because they're, they're not going to overwhelm the suspension. So it's kind of a little thing on, on uh, but, but anyway, when you do, it, some people do mark where the, where the valve stem is because race tires will, you know, if you've got a lot of grip, uh, they will kind of shift and move, so you watch that. It moves very look very much, and you want to take them and have them rebalanced. Uh, and, and also, you don't really use the, the slippy, the soapy, slippy stuff when you put the put them on. Uh, the uh, like the uh, you know the good the good tire machines. You really don't need much at all to put them on because the tire machine does all the work. Okay, so now we get to uh, Ted had a question. Uh, said on S197 on the front grip kit. Uh, does he need to upgrade to the 11 to 14 Mustang spindle as opposed to the 5 to 10 spindle? Is it because of strength or change in geometry or maybe the hub on the 11 to plus models? Uh, actually, it's, it's your, your first. It's, it's all about strength. Uh, when we do in the, in the front grip kit, <clears throat> there's a lot of geometry changes. Uh, they change everything, caster gain, camber gain, roll center, uh, anodive. When it, when it comes to front geometry, we use an extended shaft ball joint. Now we were actually, it's kind of interesting, on the, everybody has these now. Uh, we were the first to market with, a, with an extended shaft ball joint in the uh, early 90s, I'm, I'm guessing. And back then the only one that we could find was uh, for an a ASA stock car, uh, which had the wrong, wrong uh, taper. So we all either, either had to bore the taper or use an adapter. So we were using extended shaft ball joints way back then. Uh, now they're pretty much everywhere. But when it came when the 05s came out, we went to a company in uh, Colorado uh, and approached them on making the extended shaft ball joint for S197s. So they did. So that was the first S197 extended ball joint. And then from there, we actually uh, found a company that had a higher quality forging process. 
that we went to. Uh, so, but now you can get them everywhere. Has got everybody's got them, and they, they claim they they invented them, but they didn't. So, but here, here's 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 the here's the difference on the on the uh, five to tens. They use an 18 millimeter uh, ball joint. Okay, that's a five to ten. And the thing is, they have for the where the bolt goes through, it's grooved all the way around. Uh, for where the bolt goes through, so when you, when you clamp it tight. And 11, they went to the 19 millimeter ball joint. Okay, you can see the difference. Uh, 19, millimeter, not, wait, 19 millimeter ball joint. And the thing is, you don't see the groove all the way around. You see one little, one little notch in there for the bolt to go through. So, I mean, there's a big difference between the 18 and the 19 millimeter uh, in, in strength. So that's why we don't even make we don't even make the uh, 11 to fives anymore. I mean the uh, five to tens anymore. It's simply because uh, you know go strong. So so that answers your question. So yeah, and, and so we recommend that uh, anybody that's do, that's doing it, it's got a five to ten upgrade to the 11 to 14 spindles. I mean it's just it's it, it's it's safety, it's insurance. Uh, it's that's that's why we don't make them anymore. Okay, uh, let's see. We're running out of questions, and Jim is not back yet. So, so go ahead. What we're going to do? I think we should go through the presentation because I think it's pretty interesting that we have a sample trailer, um, and then Jim can uh, scoot in later, or he has so much information, Kenny, to share. We could probably actually do a separate session with him. So I'll okay. let you go through through the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, I will go through the PowerPoint then. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we we connected with uh, with Jim uh, a couple years ago for trailers. And, you know, getting getting a, a good trailer uh, is tricky. There's a lot of trailers on the market, and you just don't know where to go. You know what what to choose. And we uh, after you know talking and, and with with Jim for a while, it became pretty evident that that's where we needed to go. Uh, it's they're custom built, super high quality. Uh, and they got they got cool things that a lot of other trailers just don't have, and so we actually have had a number of trailers built for some of our customers, and it, each one is kind of like custom. And I forgot the blueprint. I got I got a blueprint for the the one we're going to show, and it, it's on my desk. Can you talk while I can get the blueprint? <laughs> oh my goodness! So uh, and actually, this is Chris Melitu's, uh trailer that we're going to be showing, and he I just saw that he is. Uh, attending today. So Chris, this is a surprise for you, uh, but we'll be showing your trailer. Um, what's really nice about these trailers is Jim's background um, and his philosophy is very close to Kenny's. Uh, he's really, he's a car guy. He's a race car guy. He knows trailers inside and out. Uh, so that's, that's a really big plus. Plus, he has the same type of philosophy that we have, where you need to build the uh, base first, uh, build okay. your platform, the the a foundation platform first, and then and then uh, you add to that. So he really he, he's really strong on that. And actually, he's just showing up. So we're gonna introduce him in just a second. I'll let him sit down. I can I can hold up the okay. This, this Go is ahead the, for the trailer. Every oops, yeah, figure, ah, there we go. You know, every trailer is custom built, and this is the blueprint for the trailer that you're gonna see here in a minute. Okay, I think Jim is getting himself settled. And I'll do a little song and dance while we're waiting. <laughs> so but what Jim is gonna cover first is he's gonna go over the top uh, tips that you need to know when you're purchasing a, to look for when you're purchasing a, a trailer. And he'll uh, speci specifically states uh, for Mustang too, what you need to look for a Mustang. Cause um, all cars are different, uh, different lengths, different weights. Oh my goodness, Kenny, you're eating another donut. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, obviously if you came in late, uh, it was uh, National Donut Day yesterday and Kenny uh, loves donuts and he had some leftovers. So I guess today's called Cars, Coffee and Donuts. I like that, Cars, Coffee and Donuts. So Jim, are you ready? I... Looks like he's getting himself set up. Yep, okay. I'm going to add him on. So, Jim, I'm going to add you on. Hey, bite. Jim. Hey, how's it going, guys? Pretty good. Sorry about that. I had to, let me move that so that light's not in the background there. 
can move around the corner here. Ugh. Had a customer come from Ohio and pick it up, and we had to get some adjustments done for him to pick up his trailer and head back. So we're back in action. Again, I apologize for the delay. Um, I want to say thanks to Kenny and everybody. Kenny, I really appreciate it. I'm excited uh, working with you guys in Mustang and uh, excited to show you different trailers and, and give you guys all the trailer information that you need to make a smart, correct decision so you have safe towing. We all have race cars. They're big investments to us. And uh, keeping them safe and secure and dry and, and uh, is very important. So... So we really appreciate you being here. Actually, Jim's going to do a master class for the Academy on trailers. <clears throat> but today he's going to do kind of like a mini master class for us. And what we're going to do is he's going to go over like the important things to look at or think about when you get, get purchasing a trailer. And then we're going to go through the, uh, we got a PowerPoint on uh, Chris Malatu's trailer. That was the, the blueprint I just showed you, which is a really cool trailer. I mean, it's like, yeah, this really cool trailer. Uh, and it's, and then it's the quality is just outstanding. So Jim, why don't you give, give everybody kind of like a quick overview of a few tips on what the, if purchasing a trailer, what they should look for or do. Sure, no problem. Well, the first thing, <clears throat> everybody always starts out usually with an old open trailer. So you got open or enclosed and there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, enclosed trailers are what's most popular and what, what most of us prefer because we take the time to put all this into our cars and Kenny gets them all ready and you want to keep them all nice and clean and dry and safe. So you can do an opener and close trailer. The next thing is size. Most of your guys' Mustangs are all 14 and a half feet long. So you don't want to get a 16 foot trailer to put roughly a 14 and a half foot car in, especially enclosed, because somehow you got to get around, tie it down and some of us aren't that small anymore, so it takes a little bit more to do that. Plus, you're going to carry spares and tires and different things. So size is very important. The next thing is axles. Um, you want to be sure that you have an axle size that will take the GBW of everything that you want to take, the car, your spares, the parts, everything that goes with that. And there's different sizes in those, and we can delve into a lot of that stuff later. Um, the different types of axles, we've got spring axles, we've got uh, an easy flex system, and we've got torsion axles. Um, and then we can get into doors, and like the one I did for Chris, we'll show you the escape doors and different things. And then there's always the question whether you want to do aluminum or steel. And uh, my always response to that is the, the last time I flew to Florida, I didn't fly on a steel airplane. So aluminum is as strong as steel and does, does the job extremely well. And there's different hitches and different things to look at, including making sure that things are 16 inch on center and so on and so forth. So kind of a fast speed zone there. So, so needless to say, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things to consider. I think the first thing though is the quality. I think the big thing is GVW and axles. I think those are probably the important things. A lot of people just kind of glaze over and uh, just, it's, if you look at a used trailer, I can tell you from experience, make sure the wheel bearings have been packed recently. Yeah. The wheel bearings have been packed and the brakes have been serviced. Right. Because I know so many people that picked up used trailers on a good deal and only to have you the wheel bearing go out or the brakes go out. Uh, so that's, from my personal experience, I know those are two things to check. Yeah. Or, or the brakes not work at all, or there's a structural flaw that, you know, a crack in the frame system. Um, a crack, a broken spring that you don't know about until you start to put stuff on it. Yeah, uh, used trailers need to be serviced. You need to go over them real well. Um, they can be a, a good deal, but they can also require a lot of money to get them back up on and safe. You, you want to be safe is the biggest thing. We got to yeah. put safety for this. So, okay, well, why don't we? We've got, we've got a little, uh, PowerPoint we put together on Chris's trailer just to show you guys when we build a custom trailer the things that we put into so that if you're looking if you want a trailer from us fine if you're looking at a trailer from someplace else here's some things you might want to think about uh, so, so let me get yeah. to just a quick uh, quick thing on this trailer um, Kenny and his team you know called me and said hey we want to do these Mustang trailers so being a car guy myself I'm like Oh, this is wonderful. 
So we kind of sat down and we went through several things that would be specific to that and work extremely well. And I got the design working and got with the factory and said, this is what I got to have. Can we do this? Can we do that? And uh, so we kind of designed this setup to optimize everything that you guys do so that uh, the trailer works to the best of its ability for everything you guys have. So, and I do the same for Formula Vs or any other kind of car. Um, but the ones we did with Kenny are, are designed for Mustangs and designed for what we're doing. So they're very specific. They work real well. So. Okay. Well, let's, let's get into PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. Okay, this is uh, this is kind of like this. You, you think you guys are gonna like this? This is really cool. I mean, it's uh, I, I've had a lot of a lot a lot of trailers over the years, and this is this is pretty much the the pinnacle of, of trailers that I've seen for for club racers or, or track guys. And this is uh, this is so actually how much room is in here? There's a lot of room. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, do you want to show us about the triple? Sure. Yeah, now this, what you're seeing here, um, a picture of the V-nose. V-noses are wonderful trailers. Uh, there's two schools of thought, flat front or V-nose. The V-nose is free space. So when we calculate a trailer, and we'll say it's a 24-foot trailer or a 20-foot trailer, that is the rectangular footprint that does not include the space of the V. And most Vs are two feet, 24 inches, 30 inches, uh, or 48 inches. This is an example of a two foot V uh, that gives you one foot, eight inches more on the inside. And then also it's an example of a triple tube tongue. And as you can see, it's an aluminum frame trailer. And uh, the triple tube tongue is important to get give safety and rigidity. And this is a platform on tongue design. And actually what you're seeing in the side where that where that triple tube in the front meets that down wall, that's actually a skirt. The platform is on top of that tongue. And uh, again, that's uh, from an engineering standpoint, and Kenny will, will tap into that. That's a, that's a strong way of making something to hold weight and hold load and go down the road, so. Okay. Now here's some, here's some cool things. I mean, the, uh, we'll go into detail, but uh, it's got the, these latches we'll talk about, these vents we'll talk about, and double double row of lights. And also down here, see these little things down here? Those are backup lights. And they're not backup lights back here, uh, which lights the, you know, lights the, where the trailer's going that you can't really see. They're backup lights on the corner, so they're going to be illuminating the corner to make it a lot easier to see when you're backing up. So, uh, Jim, why don't you tell us, these are kind of really cool locks and, yeah. and, and brake lights. Yeah, these are called vice locks. So when we order a trailer and we custom do it for you guys, we key the trailer all alike. So the key for this back, this is called a vice lock, and that bar lock locks into that. You can't cut it with bolt cutters. But the key for this is the same as your man door and your escape door. So one key will get you in the entire trailer. So the only thing you need is a key for your tongue lock and then one key for the for uh, the trailer. But those are called vice locks. Very nice, safe, secure, bolted onto the trailer door. Um, again, a very good option. Um, you're, you're also seeing here double sets of tail lights. Um, a safety feature that uh, Ken and I talked about, it's like, God, you can't have enough rearward visibility when you're going down the interstate or going down the road. You definitely want whoever's behind you uh, to be paying attention and double sets of tail lights with two turn signals, two brake lights, um, is definitely a big safety feature. So, yeah, I, I can tell you from experience of, of having trailers that carrying around like four or five different keys, uh, for all the different locks uh, on the trailer is kind of a pain. This is, this is really handy. So, and this is the, this is the, uh, you can explain that. Sure. Yeah. What, what you're looking at here, this is our, we call ATP, some people call it diamond plate. ATP is aluminum tread plate. So this is our aluminum tread plate fold down flap on our ramp door. This is a heavy duty ramp door that we reinforce and brace. Um, so it's extra heavy duty. Um, this has what we call the alpha rubber flooring in it. Uh, the old term used to be coin rubber. 
And the coin rubber of old was more like a tire inner tube rubber, which was stretchy. This is not that product. This is a much, much more superior product. You can turn the wheel, your car tires, turn your wheels on this product and it won't bunch up. And then um, the, the, the ATP flap that you see at the ramp door going in, leading into the uh, E-Track, that's called a transition flap. So that bridges that gap so you don't have that bump stop. And it also is very nice if you're two-wheel carting tires or parts in and out of the back of the trailer. Makes it for a very smooth transition from the ramp door into the, into the main deck of the trailer. Yeah, that, that's kind of handy because, I mean, I'm sure everybody's experienced, you know, <clears throat> kind of slipping the clutch. You get the car in the trailer and you get the front wheels up and then all of a sudden the front wheels drop in the gap and you know, the car kind of stops and you got to yeah, wreck the car and sometimes it jumps. But that's pretty cool. And I think that you're doing a little re redesign on this to make it a little smoother for our cars that have splitters too. I should have that. I should have that up here pretty quick. So hopefully the end of the month we'll have that redesigned. So your splitters won't touch it at all. So, and then here's a here's a here's one of the vents right here. We'll get to them in a second, and the loading lights we'll get to. Yep. Here's the coolest feature of all: a trap door or escape door. Uh, I, I don't. I can't tell you how many times I've had to hold my breath and squeeze in through the window to get into a race car, to get it out of a trailer, or to get into it to get get out or get into the into the car in the trailer this is so way cool it's a trap door so that you can you can just open the door your car door and step out with no problem and there's some special features that they put into this that jim kind of explained yeah this is called our this is called our side escape door it's 54 inches tall 72 inches wide so it's six foot wide most of your mustangs have about a 54 inch long door and so with 72 inches, we've got room to balance the trailer front to back. So we've got some scooch room in there. But the nice thing is what we do when we design these trailers, we lower that wheel box and there'll be a picture coming here quick that shows that the wheel box inside is only six inches. But from the, from the finished floor to the top of the bottom edge of that escape door is eight and a half to eight and three quarter inches is all. And your Mustangs are typically nine or so, as you can see in this one. And with that design, you can open that door completely out. You can step out onto that lower wheel box and either walk around the trailer. Some guys will put a step stool right outside and go ahead and step down and get right out of the, right out of the trailer that way. You know, the other nice thing too, Ken, is when you're at the track and the car's not in the trailer, you can have that open and have access to tires and different bits and parts that you may need getting in and out of there. So also ventilation. Uh, trailers yeah. can yeah. get hot. And you have you get a little little, uh, little awning there. You sit there with your lawn chair uh, and, and inside the trailer is cool. So lots of extra features. Something I just noticed here is is this uh you guys can see this little this is actually a little piece of yellow tape with black arrows on it. And this is on the this is on a uh, uh, side skirt a side side splitter and what that is that's we put that on on our customer cars that's <clears throat> that's the point that you can put the jack in to our jacking rails and jack up the whole side of the car at once and the other trick that we do is on the jack once once you we put the jack in place for the first time to the jacking rail we'll put a piece of tape on the jack so that all you have to do is is push the jack under here to where the tape lines up and jack it up you don't even have to get down so I just I just kind of noticed that, so I thought I'd point that out. Probably use that too, Ken, for a spot to stop the car when you're pulling the car in and out of the trailer. So, yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Yep, yep. Okay. So here here we go with the the D rings and the E track. So there's both of them in these trailers, mm -hmm. and this is actually some pretty special E track. Yeah, what we do when we do our E track, and we design the E track and the trailer flooring to maximize maximize your dollars. So the re the E-Track is recessed into the floor. It's not completely flush, but it's close. But be sure on your trailer manufacturer, and the manufacturer I use, which is uh, Lightning Rants, a Forest River product, there is an aluminum plate welded from rib to rib. Now the flooring is all 16 inch on center. So with this aluminum plate completely the length of the E-Track, this allows, if you can see, 
there is a screw in every single hole of that e-track so it's as strong at the end as it is in the middle so wherever you want to uh, put an attaching point to anchor something down you won't have a problem um, and then with the with the rubber floor we got it bordered so it's nice and tidy and then uh, we keep the d-rings in there also so if you if you do have a different strap that you want to use or you don't have your e-track latches you still have that as a fallback and then a lot of guys will use the d-rings to for parts tires pit bike whatever else you may want to uh, bring to the track and then the uh, the, the step is, is is recessed into it too mm -hmm. yeah you're recessed we we put a we put a step well in this and the easy way to tell you is if you remember the picture of the front frame well, that, the, the, the height of that frame or that five inch tube, five, seven, whatever the inch tube is in front, see, that's the distance of that step so that we drop that down. So us shorter guys, we don't have to have such a hike to get in. It makes it pretty convenient for that too, um, as far as our integrated step well. Yeah, I, I can tell you that there's been times that we've had to use uh, tires as steps to get into trailers. So, so that, that is really handy. I, I'm just, all, all the issues I've had over the years with trailers, I look at this and like, gosh, why didn't I have this back then? But here's the same thing. These are the, the, the loading lights. They're all down low. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to use a flashlight. And the vent system is pretty cool too. Uh, so why don't, you, why don't you give us a little information sure. on that? The, the round lights are the, we have a, a D-ring loading light package. And there's eight of those, and all of our lights are all LEDs. We use no incandescent lights anymore, which everybody would assume. Um, but those two and a half inch round LEDs are designed so you, you can turn those on. And I can will tell you, you know, I've strapped down race cars for 35 years better now. And every time you got a flashlight under the car, it'll roll to the other side or flip upside down and not point where you want it. Well, the nice thing about these, you can flip this on and the light comes from both the left and the right side. Doesn't matter where you're at. It'll illuminate that whole floor and make it much, much easier for you to get to your, uh, use your axle straps or however you want to strap it down, um, which makes it nice. And then our Salem vents, those big vents in the walls, those are manually opening vents. You'll see those a lot on, on semis, use them a lot, and they've used those for years. You can open them forward and rearward. And the nice thing is you'll see in the one picture, there's one high. And then on this other picture, there's one low. So you can open the front one forward and the, and the rearward open it to the rear. And actually, if, after a long weekend at the track, you got a lot of gas fumes and gas cans. You can vent the trailer and keep all those fumes out of the trailer when you go down the road by you know drafting air through and in and out of the trailer to keep all those fumes out so <coughs> and there's an extra uh 110 sock uh, uh. Yeah. yeah we can do we can do 110 power you can do 12 volt power um anything you want for that as far as additions and things but 110 power is available 12 volt power is available this is the picture I was referring to, to the low wheel box too, Ken. You can see right down there by that uh, escape door, how short that wheel box is. So, Yeah, and then the E-Tracks are only where you actually bolt down the car. Not right. Yeah, there's no reason to pay for E-Track in the middle of a car that you'll never use. So as this example is, we just, there's no reason to put it there. So. And then this shows obviously the top vent, and then this is the, the circuitry. Mm -hmm. And there's the other vent right there. Yep. Yeah, that's the other vent. Yeah, this is our typical 30 amp service. Uh, when we put a 110 system in the trailer, they're all labeled on what outlets uh, are powered. They're all individually circuited. But this is a 30 amp service that we can put in them. You can get rooftop ACs, um, just about anything you think of. We can get in your race car trailer to make your track experience just that much nicer and easier. Um, I know when I go to the track, my wife is like, you know, if we don't have AC and it's 90 degrees, it's not a not a happy sight. So, and then your roof vent for ventilation, um, you can open and close that. Um, some people like them, some people don't. We can build them without it. We can do a roof vent delete if you don't want it if you don't want it at all. But again, it's more more trailer ventilation um, and all custom to what you're after. 
And here's this is this is the uh, what he's talking about the extra space, which is being used very handily. It's kind of like free space uh, by going to the Vinos. He's got extra uh, extra cabinets. Yeah, this is our standard uh, three door bench cabinet workbench in the front. That's a brushed aluminum top, so it's easy to clean. A little brake clean will clean that right up. Uh, three nice big doors for storing parts or whatever, you know, all the extra stuff you, we all take to the track. And then if you notice, Ken, the little the little hole in the, the bottom of the middle door uh, right there, that's a, we call that a mouse hole. So if you want to have a winch and cable winch your car into the trailer, then you can mount your winch under the bench with your 12-volt battery system, and then that would be the hole for the cable to come out. So everything's concealed and out of the way, and you're not tripping over it when you're in and out of the trailer getting parts. And the battery hides neatly underneath the, the, the bench. Yep, yep. And we put a shelf in there, again, so you can put all the different spares that you're going to take, shocks, brake pieces, you know, tools, anything you want to put. We can get it all stored nice and tidy underneath there. That's the 12-volt battery system that will run all of the 12-volt system on the trailer, when you're not attached to your tow vehicle. So, and that will charge when you're going down the road, but it makes it pretty handy. So you can detach your truck. If you're somebody wants to run into town or you got to run somewhere, you still have 12 volt power at your trailer for lights and stuff. And there's a, there's the, the mouse hole. Yep. That's the mouse hole. Which, that eight, go ahead, Ken. I was going to say, if, if one, of the, one of the things that I would recommend any trailer that you do, get yourself a winch. Uh, I mean, they're, if you go to like Harbor Freight, they're not that expensive right. and uh, it just it's much easier. Uh, you, you're not going to like a lot of people burn up their clutches just getting the cars in and out of the trailer. Or if there's something wrong, you know, something the, the motor stopped or, or or you broke broke something uh, and they can't drive. Then it's just much easier to just, you know, hook it up to the winch and pull it in. Uh, it's also if you don't have a big crew. I mean, I, I'd strongly recommend any trailer that you have. Look at getting a winch, and uh, you know, wait to go on sale at Harbor Freight and pick one up. So yeah. uh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, and we when we do winches, we we do winch plates as an option. Again, you can do it if you like, but we put two parallel plates. Now that triple tube, that center tube, runs down the middle of that trailer. So you mount your winch, you'd straddle that center plate. But when we do winch plates from the factory, we put two nice big aluminum plates underneath there so you can mount your winch in any position you want and then have already the supports already there. You don't have to do anything else other than just bolt it in place and power it up. So, Okay, and this we're getting down to it's dual lights. What's your, which, which of those switches for? Now, we, we always have a switch. Your interior lights are all individually switched or switched manually, so you can turn them all on or off at once. Or, in this case, we've got lights over the ramp door, so if you're loading up at night, you can use one switch. We can put a couple lights over the back ramp door. You can flip that on. Helps with your seeing and getting around. We can also put switches on the side of the trailer, so you can have some work lights, but we can put a bank of switches um, in different places to run all your individual, either 12 volt or 110 lighting. And I think that's it. Yeah. Yep. So I need to get back to, I'm clicking buttons here. Oh, I'm back. So, hey, if you guys have questions, I forgot to say in the beginning, if you have questions on anything I talked about or questions from Jim, uh, please send them in. I usually say in the beginning, hey, I'll answer your questions live. And I got distracted with donuts. In fact, it's part of it's still sitting here and I'm lusting over it. So I have, I have to, anyway, uh, yeah, Carrie, have we got any questions out there we can talk about? Oh, we sure do. We have a lot of questions for Jim and let's see if everybody can give Jim some thumbs up and some love here for uh, attending and sharing some of this information. Um, one more comment, what's interesting is Jim is uh, going to do a master class for us and go into great detail about uh, uh, types of ax axles and the size you should do for your Mustang and, and a whole bunch of different things. So I, we're really looking forward to that. So let's start with some of the questions. Um, 10, 6, I always have to find my spot here. This technology is something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, We first question is from 
Rory, and I'm going to put both of you on the screen. And I'm going to, I'm that, uh, the brick wall there. So uh, anyway, uh, let's see, Rory, do you have. You feel like when you converse, you're talking to a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Um, so Rory has a question. Do you, uh, this is for you, Kenny. Do you make front lower A arms for a Fox or SN95 that fit stock or competitors front cross member? Uh, no, unfortunately. <clears throat> the, the thing about my suspensions is their systems, you know, and it's, it's not, you know, we, we stopped like selling parts, you know, quite a while ago because everything we do is a system. Like in, in the S197, front grip kit is a system. You got the K-member, the control arm, and the uh, the uh, uh, tie rod ends, the, the uh, bump steer tie rod ends. The K-member and the control arm are engineered together to work together. The same thing on the SN95. Uh, K members, the K member control arms are engineered to work together. Uh, it's 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 like yeah, it's it's like my parts aren't like mix and match like buy one here and buy one there. Everything's a system to work together, so you get the geometry that we're looking for. Unfortunately, but we do have in the SN95s the 94, 90, 90, 9495 uh, K members are for the, the Windsor, and they will work in a Fox with a little bit of modifications, a few things you have to trim up. Uh, but they will work in a fox. So, you know, fortunately, our, our, our control arms don't fit uh, other K members. And just because it, it's everything we do is a system. It's, it's in, nobody engineers geometry like I do. And that's the need to keep the, the uh, when you buy my stuff, it's going to work. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, who's next, Carrie? Okay, Chris, Chris Melitu has a nice comment. He said, Jim was easy to work with and he's on on the track so he knows what uh, you need and what what you don't need. Uh, he's, yeah, that's why we've chosen. Uh, that was Chris's trail. Chosen Jim. Yep, yeah, <laughs> that was. Okay, there's another one, Cliff saying congrats. Uh, good trailers are really hard to find. Um, and then we also have a uh, donut. Uh, this is Greg. Uh, donuts are what you need <laughs> to do the rear tires. So that was good. And we have another one, Rory says. Right here. All I can say is when building your car, uh, takes the time to install tie down tabs points or screw in points on your car. Sad to say most European cars come with them. Do you guys have any comments on that? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, there's, if, there's, if you can, uh, there's ways to put uh, tabs underneath uh, for tie downs. Uh, and yeah, if you're building a car from scratch uh, or building a car up, you know, think about some tie downs uh, so that, you know, we don't have to like, put the strap around the axle and maybe hit the panel bar and bend it or, or, or front wheel. Just make it, it makes life so much easier if you already got a place to click it down on. So yeah, that's a real, that's a really good point. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. You know, one, one thing too, Ken, um, what I like to recommend to a lot of people is most people don't realize when we set it, when we set a trailer up, like we do for you guys, it's set for that car. Your front straps don't have to be ratchet straps we can get you permanent straps that will just click click into place so if you have those tabs you can click the two fronts in come to the back have two ratchet straps in the back and boom boom you got two ratchets you're right into place you mark the floor you're in and out of there in a jiffy and everything works really smooth so those those tabs are real important for that type of stuff so uh, I, I like that is a person that's is laid down and tried to crawl underneath oh, yeah. So, okay. okay, what's the next question, Carrie? Next question, please explain standard axle versus spread axle. Sure, that's no problem. Standard axles, uh, uh, spring axles are attached together in the, with a center attaching point. And that point has a rectangular, most of the time it's a solid rectangular steel piece. Spring axles self-level and most people don't realize this, but a spring axle setup self levels. So if you're tongue high or tongue low, or if you're overloaded, the axle will self level. And that's what all that little mechanism is between the standard spring axles. Spread axles, spread axle design is where you spread the axles apart. Now spread axle design can only be used in conjunction with torsion axles because you're gonna open that gap up. Now, when you see a trailer that has the sidewall of the trailer and the fender coming all the way down 
between the two axles and you, you don't have an outside or exposed fender, you can't see any of the suspension, that's typically what we call a spread axle design. The spread axle design is, is mostly used on longer trailers because it spreads the load out over the frame of the trailer to give it a little more balanced and a little bit easier tow. So this is some of the stuff we'll delve into in master class, but that's kind of the nutshell uh, of spring axle or standard axle versus spread axle. Okay, who's next, Gary? We got uh, Rory says, love that escape door. Yeah, that's that is probably, awesome. that's the coolest part of the trailer. Yep. And then we have Chris. Uh, he, he, Chris has a tip here. He uses the roof of the skate latch and um, puts a chair on it at a track event, and it's nice and cool. Stays out it's in the shade. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm looking for the next question here. Okay, here's from Kobe. Do you offer camera systems for backup and monitoring the surrounding? Uh... Um, yeah, com camera systems now, you know, that that technology is advancing so fast. You can get them to be on your cell phone. You know, to integrate something into your tow vehicle is not a problem. You know, some of the major manufacturers now have the surround picture camera, which somehow, you know, it, it sees around the whole trailer. But yeah, camera systems are available. There's so many of them out there. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll run a, a deadhead 12 volt wire and people will have a, a camera system that they prefer uh, based off specifications or how they, how they are. And then we can run a deadhead camera and then a uh, deadhead wire and then you can mount whatever camera you like in specific or we do offer one already set up. So yes, they are available. There we go. Next question is from Greg. Do you offer the transition plates separately and how much? Yeah, they are available and you can mount them. You can mount them. They're typically designed to mount onto the door and then slide into the trailer, in and out of the trailer as you open and close the door. You can mount them on the, on the deck of the trailer and then flip them up as you go back and forth. You do have to be careful because that distance that it slides in will cover if you have d-rings at the very very back edge of your trailer that transition flap will slide in and cover those so there is some things that you want to take precaution those are usually run the full one for an eight and a half foot trailer usually run about 120 dollars all, all set up with all the screws and fasteners you just attach it so okay okay next question but before we go to the next question uh we're coming up to last call and questions so if you have any more questions for jim that or kenny this is the time to put them in the comments box um let me go to the next question for you this is a good one as well um are these trailers approved for export to canada yes all of our trailers are, are north american standards that is yes in fact next week i've got i've got them going to alaska next week <laughs> So, yes. Okay. Okay. And here's another one. Um, I have a low boy, boy uh, open tilt deck. Have there been such a version of, a, of an enclosed made? A low boy open tilt deck. We are working on a design to have, uh, there's, a, there's a trailer design out there that's called a no ramp. In other words, the back door, the back of the trailer drops level with the ground. Um, to have a tilt in an enclosed trailer has not been developed yet. And I'm not sure how the engineering would work in, to do a tilt enclosed trailer. But in the enclosed trailer with the framing system we're talking about, we, we're bringing that up through the system where it's hydraulically drops it down. That, that no deck or no, no ramp trailer is available in an open configuration just because of all of the hydraulics right now. So we're working on that. So. Well, that's another great question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's how long can we get these trailers in? I'm not sure what that means. Calvin, you guys understand that? Yeah. How, how, how long of a trailer can you get on, on, on a, uh, on a tongue? Yeah. The, typically uh, all our trailers are available in two for an increments starting at 14 in car haulers starting at 14 feet and going all the way to goosenecks so we can do a 32 foot or a 34 foot tag trailer and then you can go into a gooseneck so 
any two foot increment in that category. I, I can tell you guys that my favorite size is 28 foot, 28 or 30, uh, just simply because you can get lots of stuff in. Yeah. And, and then if you have too much stuff, if, if you got the, the D ring set up and kind of like inch the car back a little bit, it helps take the weight off a ton. So yeah, uh, tw 28 or, or 30 are my favorite sizes. Yeah. Here recently for, for track guys, budget guys, 22 footers have been kind of a sweet spot here lately. So we, I, in fact, the people from Ohio just left, they got a 22 footer and uh, that's been a sweet spot too. It all depends on your need. If you're going to take a golf cart, that's too short. Like Kenny said, 28, 24, 26, 28, 30. If you're going to, it depends all what you want to take to the track. That's exactly correct. Cool. Okay. Well, that's a bit. He, okay. he's, he, he's getting all the questions today. I'm not getting any. I feel locked down. <laughs> it's just beat up. Kenny, it's beat up on the new guy. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> okay. So uh, let's, I, I want to get a, uh, some feedback. Uh, who would like to get, get an invite to Jim's masterclass? So if you just uh, comment, um, yes, I'm in or whatever you want to uh, comment, uh, then we'll make sure we uh, get you on the list to invite you to that masterclass. Okay, here's the next question, and this is going to win. And this is the last question I have right now, guys, unless somebody adds something else. So here we go. This is from Brian. On an open trailer, I'm tying through the wheel. What's your opinion on tying to the chassis or the wheels? Well, here's the thing, and, and Ken may be able to shed a little light, too. When you're tying through the wheels with what we call a wheel lasso or a wheel hoop, now this is through the spoke. You know, you're going to put a lot of pressure in a small area of that rim and you don't want to crack a rim as far as that part of it goes. So you want to be careful if you're tying through the wheel like that. My suggestion is you don't cross the straps because then you're going to put pressure on the suspension system, um, you know, left and right or force the front tires to tow in to tow each other. Um, the wheel nets are really nice if you want to tie over the wheel and not tie to the suspension. And those are available in several different, several different configurations, but they're like a wheel net that goes over the whole wheel that holds the wheel in place. Um, I'm a chassis suspension tie down guy. I, my race cars all have tie down hooks built in um, or the tags like we talked about just because um, I think that's a much safer tow, and I, I'm usually going to like Road America or long bigger places, so it's a little farther travel. But Ken, what's your what's your thoughts? Well, we've had in, in I mean, if you can get under the chassis, that's the best. But <clears throat> what I found there's a lot of times some of our cars are like really low, and they got big splitters, which makes it really tough. So, and on our cars, we always use like we use like forge line wheels, which are super super strong, so you got no problem with them. But what we'll do is we'll actually go in the spokes and come out and put a two by four on the tire and then bring the strap forward so that we miss the miss the splitter and, and make, make it go straight and ratchet it down that way. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, but we only do that with the wheels we know are super strong. Yeah. You know, it just makes it so much easier. I mean, you got that much between the splitter and, and, the, and the floor of the trailer. And it's like, well, what do you do? Unless you got tow hooks in the front. That's another thing. You always use tow hooks in the front. Yeah, e either way, uh, like uh, I, I agree with you 100%. You know, your cars are so low that those wheel nets or wheel lassos are the way to go. So yeah. if, we, if your wheels are strong, then it should be no issue. Yeah, because we like at least forge line wheels and you okay. need the forge line. I mean, that's, that's the absolute top of the class. Yep. So, okay, Carrie, what have you had any more? Uh, that's it for questions, but uh, real quick, um, if one of you can give an overview of uh, maybe, Jim, what uh, what you're going to go over in the master class, just a few highlights of what you'll be uh, covering. Uh, some of the stuff, we'll start with the basics trailer, trailer construction. Um, make sure you got 16 inch on center floors and lengths for cars like your Mustang and how much stuff you're taking to the track. Another important thing is GBWs. Um, 3,500 pound axles versus 5,200 pound axles um, or 6,000. And if you're going to a longer trailer like Kenny likes, even 7,000 pound axles. Um, bumper pull versus uh, gooseneck. Um, 
how to equip the trailer, escape door, positioning of everything in the trailer so that the, the car is in the right position on the trailer, um, brakes, making sure your brakes are correct, wheel bearings and wheel bearing service, trailer service, steel versus aluminum, um, kind of a complete overview of safety and safety chain hookup, uh, uh, all the electrical system, making sure your trailer brakes are working correctly. Um, we'll get we'll get pretty in depth in everything. So, I think uh, hey, I, I think anybody that has any interest at all in a, in a trailer, uh, I mean, it, it, that'd be you know sign up. I think that'd be really good educational for you. So we got that. Thank, thank care. You just said have them sign me up, or we'll probably put something in the newsletter too. I think. Yeah, we'll put something in the newsletter. But uh, if you want to just put your name in here, if you want us to get send you a uh, request to sign up, that would be great. So um, I think that that is it. Uh, boy, Jim, great information. Kenny, I'll, I'll let you take over from here. Uh, well, yeah, that was good. I mean, even I, I always learn when we have guests on, I always learn something. So, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's kind of the cool thing about having special guests. Uh, okay, next week, looking at my notes. Oh, Tony the Tuner. Is Tony the Tuner on next week? T Carrie, is this right? We have yep. Tony the Tuner. We have too? Tony the Tuner. And then the following week, we have a mini break workshop. So we're going to try that on Saturday morning and see how that works. Oh, so, well, good stuff coming up. For those who don't know, Tony, Tony the Tuner is somebody that we've known for a while and use exclusively. Uh, for tuning. He's, uh, he has probably the number one tuning guy in the country for Mustangs. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty cool. He used to, he used to instruct tuning for all the different manufacturers, tuning manufacturers. Uh, but HP uh, just didn't want him, uh, anybody else having him because he's so good. So he's full time at HP now. But when we, we tune our cars, it's, we do it remotely. Uh, you know, I don't rely on somebody local with a little laptop trying to figure out what to do. I mean, I just go straight to the man. And what we do is we'll get set up in the dyno. Kurt will use his computer to log in. Uh, we'll do some dyno runs. We'll download the data files to Tony. He does a little thing. He sends the data file back. We do another dyno run and we keep doing that till we come up with what we do. Uh, like on, for example, on, on uh, Cliff's uh, uh, FR500S with the, the top end package, uh, the uh, uh, World Challenge upgrade package, we ended up with uh, 380 uh, rear wheel horsepower and the power curves and torque curves were just smooth as silk. So he, he, this is the guy that knows how to tune cars. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward because every, every time he's on, I learn, and again, I learn something every time he comes on. He's so smart. And then uh, brakes, uh, you know, a mini brake workshop. Uh, brakes are pretty important uh, on track day cars because uh, you know, everybody thinks about going fast. That, that, you know, it's, it's stopping can be a problem. And it's best to use the brakes rather than trees or guardrails or concrete barriers or other cars. So that'd be kind of, that'd be, that'd be I, it's first I learned about the brake workshop. So see, I'm learning everything every day. So well, listen, we appreciate everybody being here this week. And uh, we'll look forward to having Tony next week. And Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Yep, and uh, I think uh, with that, I got some donut left I'm going to eat. So. We'll see you, the Academy guys. I'll see you Tuesday night and everybody else. I'll see you next Saturday. Thank you.